Good afternoon. Hope everybody is able to get on to our webinar pretty smoothly. This is a webinar focused on social skills and specifically we're going to be emphasizing some tools and techniques and some tricks that would be helpful for you in your best practices of supporting children and adolescents and perhaps you'll find that the strategies that we discuss as well this afternoon will be helpful for adults uh, and any other whether family members or students or other professionals in a variety of capacities that that you may be involved in uh, i want to take a moment and, and again thank you for joining us my name is dr michael selbst i'm a licensed psychologist as well as a certified school psychologist in new jersey and in pennsylvania I'm also a board certified behavior analyst at the doctoral level, and I serve as director of Behavior Therapy Associates. We're a group private practice of psychologists and BCBAs, and we're located in Somerset, New Jersey. So the focus that we're going to have, again, will be on social skills and talking about best practices and share a number of different tips and techniques and strategies. And we'll spend the last several minutes sharing some generalization in terms of our summer social skills program. If you joined us for the initial webinar, which we did a couple months ago, uh, there was a much more information we provided regarding extended school year programming and a lot of details regarding our high step summer program. In today's workshop, it'll be primarily focused on social emotional learning strategies and tips and techniques with some information again at the end regarding our summer program. And you can certainly visit our website if you're interested in getting more information. We are able to accept questions that uh, come up and if you have some questions, you can just post those through uh, indicating through the, um, through the dashboard and I'll see those and we'll do my best to address as many of those as I can. We will also make the PowerPoint available to everybody that's participating. You'll be able to see a replay of the event and you'll also receive a certificate for one hour of uh, professional development as educators. And we'll send that to everybody that has participated in the webinar. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to start and load up our PowerPoint here and you'll still see me in the, the corner of the screen as we go through. So what I really want to uh, begin with is just really kind of setting the stage for what social and emotional learning is. And we've changed through the years and some of the terminology and the lingo. It used to be we would use the term social skills, and that's pretty common uh, still nowadays. But it's taken kind of a broader uh, array where we have this umbrella of social and emotional learning, which encompasses in many ways we could say everything under the sun. But it, it really emphasizes how we interact with one another. The development of pro-social skills and in addition the decreasing of challenging or disruptive or interfering behaviors and it's really that interplay between the two that if we're having a good solid behavior plan we should always have some replacement behaviors that we're going to be increasing or training and teaching for that particular student so it's a combination of helping one to acquire and effectively apply those skills not just the acquisition but displaying those performing those where and when needed and generalizing those we want to help the individual to be able to develop that ability to have perspective taking and empathy and to really form those relationships so that they're not just thinking about themselves but thinking of somebody else so we talk about in the field theory of mind which is one's ability quite simply to put myself in your shoes and imagine how you're thinking and how you're feeling and to demonstrate and be mindful of my own behavior in relationship to others in this world and being a good observational learner, being able to look up and make eye contact, to think about and feel how somebody else might be feeling, that empathy component is really significant in not only developing but maintaining meaningful social interactions as we, we walk through our, our world. Um, and, and it's based upon that those relationships are meaningful and whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship or parent to child or teacher to child, whatever it is, we want that to be a meaningful relationship that can grow. And we know that some children may initiate and develop an initial relationship, but sustaining that requires a real host of skills, many of which we're gonna talk about as we go through today. Uh, this wheel that we're showing, and some of you may have seen this before, it's been adopted by the Department of Education in New Jersey and really comes out of the collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning, or CASEL. And CASEL.org is a wonderful resource 
of objective information. And what you're seeing here with this wheel is really the five tenets or five primary components that we think about with social emotional learning. And I just talked about social awareness and how critical that is understanding and empathy. And if we just go clockwise, self-management is critical. We're gonna talk a bit today about regulation skills, the ability to self-regulate, to manage, be mindful and aware of one's emotions and their behavior so that they can not just be able to verbalize and communicate their feelings, but to do so in a way that they can manage that, that I can be feeling sad or feeling frustrated and I can be calm at the same time, which is a concept that's awfully difficult for children and for some adults for that matter, to be able to notice and experience one emotion while also having the ability to regulate and to stay calm with your body and with your words in an appropriate manner. Uh, Self-awareness is that awareness that I, I know what my strengths are, I know what my weaknesses are, I have an awareness of what the challenges are, and what am I going to do with that? That's why it's so difficult yet so important for us as adults to help a child who has either a weakness or a disability to have a greater awareness about what their challenges are and what they're likely to be experiencing as they go through the lifespan, even if we're not getting into diagnostic information, to educate them about what they do well, what they're successful with, and when and if they're experiencing difficulties, how do we manage that and how do we overcome that? Responsible decision making, which is very much linked with social problem solving, is being able to identify that there's a problem. There's something that's not going well, whether it's that I'm struggling with my math or my reading, or I don't have ample lunch money, can't find my shin guards and I'm headed over to soccer, or I'm having a conflict with a family member or with a peer. And to notice that's a problem and I want to do something about it. So what's my goal? How do I want to go about intervening and changing? What's the host of solutions here? Can I evaluate solutions? Which is the best one? And if you're thinking about that, we probably know a lot of adults that struggle with that because developmentally, it's a tough skill. Cognitively, it's tough. So it's one of those scaffolding types of skills that continually we're working toward to increase our problem solving ability to have this proverbial toolbox over time. We'll talk more about that as well. Relationship skills. How am I with you and how do I want you to see me? And how do we effectively manage conflicts that may arise in whatever relationship we might have. I mentioned that the New Jersey Department of Education has basically adopted this. If you go on their website, you'll see this wheel because there's a lot of really understanding and greater alignment and appreciation for how critical this is, particularly as New Jersey and more and more states are moving toward having core content standards. And I think that, uh, we'll be seeing that in the, the coming years where we, I imagine at some point, we'll have every state have core content standards, which would mean that we will have dedicated direct instruction that will be required for every student. It's not that yet that that, that that's the case with every uh, state at the moment, but there are a number of states and that number is growing, just like language arts and math and science and social studies, where there's a core period every day dedicated for that for universally for students. Uh, we would anticipate we would see that in New Jersey and all states at some point. Uh, again, that's as the movement continues to, to go in that direction. Interventions, and to that point, when we talk about overall interventions that's really at a universal level, universal supports that our focus on social emotional learning is not on any particular area or disability or age of a student, but the idea at that tier one level that we do some universal screening, but more so some, and, and universal screening, I mean, we're checking in with students and sometimes that could be more formal assessments that a district could do, but you really want as a school, as a district, to look at what's the culture and the climate and how do we move forward with a positive social emotional learning within that school environment and provide some level of direct social emotional learning instruction to every student and embedding that throughout the day. Tier two, of course, would be students that are at risk and that could be student who is identified through the INRS team and it could be a student who is going and seeing the counselor or a teacher or parent that could be concerned. And we are already identifying that there's some level of risk or concern and then providing some greater level of intervention than all other students may be receiving. 
And then tier three would commonly be a student who has a 504 accommodation plan or an IEP and receiving special education services where the intensity of the social emotional learning is greater. And if we kind of use that analogy of a faucet that we would turn on this, the, the amount of social emotional learning through a faucet and it would be turned on much greater as we go from tier one to tier two to tier three, supporting our learners in a way that's going to help them to really advance and to meet their needs where they are and recognize that it's continually growing as they go through the lifespan. So if we kind of look at best practices and bear this down to the, the, the components that are going to yield skill building, it's really not unlike what we would do when we're teaching a child to read, write, do math, tie their shoes, learn how to do the laundry or ride a bike. We would take a skill, break it down into the specific steps. And if I'm the educator, I'm going to teach those steps one by one and model that. A golf instructor is gonna do the same thing, riding that bike, teaching multiplication. So I'm gonna discuss it, tell you what the steps are, I'm going to demonstrate through modeling, and then I'm going to have you do that. And I'm going to give you continual feedback so that we can shape that. Oftentimes, I find that when I'm consulting, I might hear a teacher say, well, yeah, we, we reviewed that and we did some role play only to find out that the role play was more like the teacher saying to the child, what, do you, what will you do next time? Or this is what you should do next time, not the actual behavioral rehearsal and what we know about social learning theory and behavioral principles is we need to have that rehearsal. We need to have that core set aside practice time with repetition and focused repetition with attention is what really creates those new neural pathways. So again, we want to have attention, focus that attention with intention and repetition over and over again. And that's how we get that automaticity. That's how we get it where it's seemingly muscle memory versus a child going up and saying, uh, uh, hi, hi my, my name is Mike, what's your name? What instrument do you play? What instrument do you play? What instrument do you play? We wanna move from the road because the skill hasn't become automatic to getting that increasingly more automatic through that plan practice, through that feedback, and through guiding that and shaping that to where we can generalize those skills and promote something that's going to go across multiple situations. So if we were to take the skill, for example, of just having that interaction to promote conversation, we're gonna name the skill specifically first. We're gonna talk about what that looks like and we're gonna model that. So we'll take you through a specific skill and, and describe what that looks like. So greeting someone. And we all have experience with greeting someone. However, it looks a little bit different, whether it's a preschooler who might go and wave to somebody and smile, whether it's a, an elementary school student who might use a little bit more language or a middle school student who we probably don't want to have them go up and shaking hands or waving, but it might just be kind of a, a head nod or a fist pump in the hallway or something with some language. It's going to change a little bit, but I think we would all agree that there would be some specific steps with some variety depending upon the situation and the people involved. We break it down. We talk about why is this important in the first place? Well, it's important so you get to meet people. It's important so that you can have someone you can play a game with. You can develop more friendships. You know who's in your classroom or who's on the bus and, and who you can spend your time with, right? So that makes sense. We're checking in with them about finding some connection with them. All right, let's go through the steps and ideally, I'd want to have this through some dialogue and some discourse where we're working together with the child and say, what do you think you might do first? So if you're all the way over there and there's a bunch of other kids, how would we know who we were even wanting to meet? Well, you'd want to increase that proximity. You know, I want to move closer to the person. I want to make some eye contact. I want to say, hi, my name is Mike. What's your name? And then might ask him about something. So I think we would all know how to greet someone, but what we often find is putting the steps down on paper and then reviewing them for the child and having them practice, that becomes a little bit harder because now we're making it very concrete. It's like you might know how to prepare and make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or you might know how to make scrambled eggs, but if you had to go step by step by step, it might not be as easy as you think. And for the learner who's never done that before, a little bit more challenging on their side. And 
we can add to the complexity of it if you have a learner who is not only nonverbal, but whose cognitive skills may be pretty significant and they don't have the language or the receptive understanding to be able to comprehend what we're saying. In that case, we're likely to be using more visuals and probably would benefit more from video modeling, which fortunately has a real strong uh, research base and in developing and, and demonstrating some of the appropriate steps that are involved. We go ahead and demonstrate that show what that looks like to greet someone, whether with a child, with other adults. And if this sounds like that it's simple, wonderful, because this is not rocket science, but it requires a dedicated plan to teach the skills, whether it's greeting someone or something else. Having them then go ahead and do that and give them feedback. One of the phrases that we wanna make sure we're doing is behavior specific feedback or labeled feedback. We would refer to as labeled praise, behavior specific praise. We wanna be sure that we're praising the behavior, not just praising the child. So we don't wanna say good boy or good girl. We'd wanna say, I really like the way you are, dot, dot, dot. I really like the way that you made eye contact. You did a wonderful job staying calm, speaking clearly and moving closer to the person. Great job being able to use an inside voice Good to, and, and on and on, again, praising the behavior rather than the child so that we can really foster the greater likelihood that that skill will continue. Where children struggle a lot as well is with comments and questions. And an analogy I often use that we can think of and most of us can relate to is if you get together for like a large family event, maybe it's a wedding or some other kind of event, or maybe it's a high school reunion, you haven't seen people for a while. And if we had the dialogue here, I'd say, well, what questions do you kind of you ask? And, and we usually say things like, how have you been? How's the family? What have you been up to? Where are you working? Where do you live? Right? Maybe there's another question or two that would come after that. But after three or four questions or three exchanges, as we commonly would have in a, an IEP goal and obje objective, we might be stretching it and, and we're thinking, what's my exit strategy? To whom can I now go and, and speak? Maybe I'm gonna go and get something to eat or get something to drink. You're looking for, how do I move? Unless you wanna stay with that conversation or unless you feel like compelled that you have to stay in the conversation. So on this screen, there's just some examples of comments and questions. And what we wanna do is we wanna help make the child aware. Remember that awareness factor of that wheel for social emotional learning raises the person's awareness that in order to keep the conversation going, I have to ask some questions. Well, um, what did you do? Who went with you? Where did you go? What was that like? How did you get there? Could I go with you? So make them aware that asking a question can extend the conversation. And then it's like the wheels are gonna be turning and I can start to think of a host of potential questions. And for a child that has some reading ability, we can even have some conversation starters of who, what, when, where, why, how, just on a cue card for them. Comments as well. Hey, I just went out to the best restaurant. Yeah, you don't want the dead silence after that. So, you know, I, hey, I like to go to a restaurant too. Or, um, yeah, I love Italian food. That's great. Or, yeah, I went there once also. So not only the language, but what's the emotion that's connected with that. So increasing that skill is through some practice and giving them specifically, what can they say? What can they do that's going to really kind of move them along to, to be successful in expanding that conversation? Uh, shifting a little bit to, to feelings. So helping a child to be able to identify, again, some self-awareness and communicate, which is related to regulation, that feeling vocabulary. If you've worked with kids who struggle with this area, they often will be kind of polarizing that I feel good or I feel bad, or I feel happy, I feel sad, or maybe they feel mad. But to help a child understand that there's a number of emotions that precede anger, it could be frustration, embarrassment, disappointment, uh, anxiety, surprise, scared, worry, nervous. And when those feelings are not well managed, that could fuel then the anger. And even if we feel angry, we can stay calm and we can manage that. But we want to help a child to expand their feelings vocabulary. What are some up feelings? What are some down feelings? Am I feeling positive or negative, good or bad? And then get into more specific language that's associated with that. And then even better, can we do a check-in? Well, how strong or how weak are your feelings? Is it a, a five on a one to five scale? Is it a 10 on a one to 10 scale? So having the child check in when they arrive and throughout the day. For a learner who might be a bit more advanced and maybe just, you know, how you doing? What, what are you feeling at the moment? 
And for a child that might have a little more difficulty, we might need some visuals. We might have uh, some pictured scenarios. We might have the verbiage, the, the particular vocabulary words where they can check in to see how they're doing. So labeling their feelings, but also to label on, on others. And if you're in a classroom setting or consulting to or, or joining the webinar as a, as a family member, so thinking about how can I model that? So if you're feeling kind of tired coming in, say, you know what? I, I really had a tough time going to sleep last night. And how do you think I'm feeling today? I'm feeling tired. Okay. But am I acting tired? How can I be feeling this and acting that? Right. Hey, I was in a lot of traffic today and that was a bit frustrating, frustrating for me. So I feel frustrated and look, I'm going to tackle the day. I'm going to move forward. So helping them to recognize that as adults, we have different feelings as well. And what can I do with that? Uh, what's my ability to communicate that? So, uh, and that kind of links with this next slide here of functional communication, of being able to make my wants and needs known, and likewise to communicate my feelings associated with that. Uh, I, I often find that when I'm consulting, I'll find that staff members will say, hey, well, the child is able to communicate that they need a break, they're able to ask for help. And then my follow up question is, well, how often does that happen that they use that skill? Mm, not really. Oh, OK, well, so if they're not really using that skill, but they have the ability, then we have to help them to perform that more likely in that situation to generalize it. So there might be a break card. It could be that they have some kind of card and we can just give it to them and they can pass it over to the adult when needed. It, it may be that because they're struggling that we need to give them some visual and they can point to that or they can give us a card. And that gets into picture communication symbols or other kinds of augmentative devices. But certainly we wanna be mindful that under the social emotional learning umbrella is helping an individual to be able to communicate more effectively, not just conversation, but to make their basic wants and needs met in a more appropriate manner. Impulse control, staying calm. It's probably one of the greatest reasons why children end up being referred to outpatient facilities, private practices, for going down to guidance. Yes, there could be internalizing issues, but they end up in whether child study team guidance or the administrator's office, often because we're seeing some challenging behavior. And of course, we know that, well, what are the desired behaviors? It's to have my body calm. It's to use calm words and communicate appropriately and clearly. It's to notice, hey, I'm having a problem. And there's so much wonderful progress that can come out of someone noticing that and asking for that. If you think about you know, an infant, a toddler who is able to reach up because they want someone to pick them up or they want to indicate that they need a bottle or they want something, they're hungry or they're thirsty. Otherwise, kind of universally, what does the baby do? They cry, right? And babies who cry, become older and they might have various ways, of course, to indicate that they want or need something. Ideally, it's through some way of functionally appropriate communication. But when that's not happening, we see crying and other kinds of tantrum behavior, which could be physical or dropping to the floor or withdrawal behavior. So we want that individual to be able to communicate in a more effective way, noticing where is their body in that situation, maintaining space and being able to, to keep themselves calm. So what that involves is being able to recognize the emotions, but also be able to manage and tolerate stress a lot better over time. And I want to repeat that because it's important that being able to regulate better is about managing and tolerating stress. Often we want to get rid of stress and hence there's a struggle that happens a lot. It's like you're driving and there's a detour, there's traffic, and we would want nothing more than to get rid of that detour and to get rid of the frustration to get rid of the traffic but oftentimes that's not really feasible if we can avoid that if we can move around that wonderful that's problem solving but if we can't then we also have to problem solve to be able to manage and regulate my emotions even though i'm in this situation and that allows us to be able to have some greater self-control and then to also participate more fully in whatever the situation oftentimes that's due to Poor impulse control, so not thinking first and being mindful and reflective, but just kind of acting. It's often because there have been some learned aggressive responses to the situation that, hey, if I drop to the floor, if I kick, if I hit, if I bite, throw, scratch, whatever it may be, that gets you to move away. And for the moment, 
that may decrease demands. That gets whatever's bothering me to give me some distance. So that works. And that's not real helpful. So we've got to sometimes do what we call putting a behavior on extinction, which is not allowing the child's behavior to get what it wants. But in terms of focus today, we're wanting to help the child to be able to manage and tolerate that, which means that they have to learn some skills to be able to calm themselves down. So we talked about noticing feelings, noticing up, noticing down feelings, and kind of staying focused on what's important. So when working, whether with a child or an adult, as I saw a couple of patients earlier today, we talked about some situations where there's something that was outside of their control and they had to look at, well, what's important? So I'm driving and this other driver is really, really frustrating me with their behavior. So what do I do with that? Uh, do I curse at them? Do I get out? Do I engage in road, play, uh, road rage? Do I slam on the horn? What do I do? Well, my primary goal is getting to the office safely. All right. If that mean, if, if that remains as my goal, that's a lot different than my goal is to get out my frustration at you and to get you back for cutting me out while we're driving. So helping the child to think about what is meaningful? What is the goal here? What's the grander goal versus in the moment wanting to just communicate and express the feelings? And they can communicate and express feelings if it's appropriately, but to be able to I want to not have frustration anymore is not really what regulation is about. Regulation is about to notice and to experience and be willing to experience that frustration, that stress, and to be thinking, well, what do I really value? What do I care about? Which recognizing is difficult for a child and for some adults to acknowledge, but we want to help coach that individual to look at it and say, hmm, where you really need to be going is getting my homework done, participating in school maintaining this friendship or starting this friendship or getting to work safely. So uh, helping them to refocus can help them to move forward. So we can teach just like any other skill, say starting a conversation, we can te teach reg regulation skills. We can help the individual to start to be a better noticer. Observing is a skill. We can help an individual to be a better observer of their own behavior and others and noticing what does it feel like? Noticing how does my behavior affect others and to be able to reflect on, hmm, I kept my body calm and I didn't yell at you. I didn't curse at you. I used an inside voice and kept my hands to myself. And look how well that worked out. I'm frustrated, but 10 minutes ago, my frustration and anger was at a 10. Now it's at a nine. Check in an hour later, it's at a seven. Check in three hours later, it's at a five. The next day we're at a three. A week later, maybe we're to one or I forgot about it. So being able to review and process what happened is helping that individual to notice that what I'm feeling in the moment is not what's going to be sustained over time. And that's a real difficult concept for people because in the moment, they just want to release it and they don't know how to manage that. Hence, lots of practice. Video modeling can be really helpful. Videotaping themselves with permission we can videotape the child and have them see it back watching others with permission or even pulling off some good well-made commercially available mod video modeling series to benefit from watching what appropriate desirable behavior is what we're really doing is we're increasing psychological flexibility noticing the frustration yet being flexible enough to be accepting that it's uncomfortable right now and i'm going to move on and now it's important if somebody's doing public speaking, hey, I'm uncomfortable and I'm speaking. I'm uncomfortable and I'm singing. I'm uncomfortable and I'm, I'm standing up at the plate ready to, to hit the ball, or I'm uncomfortable and frustrated and I'm studying for my test, I'm doing my work, I'm staying in this situation. So that's a really critical skill towards self-regulation is to notice those emotions, notice what that feels like, you know, physiologically, what's my automatic response? And we see a bunch that are listed here. So helping the individual be more aware of those sensations and not that it's necessarily that all of the alarms have gone off and I need to get out of here. That's the fight, flight, freeze response that is innate in us, which has real good value. But if we're always doing that, then we're not engaging, noticing and calming down. We're reacting. Again, reacting is great if somebody's if a ball is rolling in the street and I need to go and stop and make sure I don't get hit by the car and give up the ball. But it's not great if our alarm is always going off whenever we're stressed and we have literally fight with aggression 
eloping or fleeing the situation or freezing and not responding. So it's a skill that we want to help to foster among the children with whom we work. So we're talking about moving from that automatic pilot, that automatic response to having a different response. Again, practice, rehearsal. So we're going to gradually increase the experience or stress level by presenting a variety of different situations. Uh, one of the later slides, we call it situations in a hat. So you might take a bunch of different three by five cards or post-it notes, and I'm going to write on here different triggers. So I'm going to get a drink and somebody cut me in front of the line, or I'm taking a test and I forgot everything I learned. We're playing a game and he grabbed the ball or she grabbed the remote from me. Okay, so we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna discuss it. We're gonna communicate our feelings, communicate what that feels like. Think about how the other person would feel. We're gonna problem solve, like what's my goal here? What are the different solutions? And then we're gonna practice it. And if done right, that could be five minutes. It could be 10 minutes. It doesn't have to be much longer than that, but we're gonna kind of get in, we're gonna get practice it, and we're gonna get out. And that could be done after dinner, before dessert. It could be done as a morning meeting in school. It could be just before we go to the cafeteria. It, there's lots of different ways, but we want to be able to foster that the development of that as a skill through increased practice so that we can improve that. Um, there's something called four square breathing where we're just going to kind of breathe in for four seconds. We're going to hold that. We're going to breathe out for four seconds and kind of hold that as well. I'm doing a an augmented version of it here, but it's a skill being able to slow the breathing down and as you're sitting, whether at home or work or car or wherever you may be, just take a moment. And it's not often that we are mindful and just stepping back and working on that breathing. But oftentimes we ask kids to take breaths. They, they're just they're not really able to do that well enough. And it's not very meaningful because they haven't practiced that. So practicing four square breathing could be very helpful in helping them to be able to have a better sense in managing their their, their emotions and the, the level physiologically how they're doing. Progressive muscle relaxation is another type of technique. And you can see through the caption here that we're kind of tightening particular muscles, particular areas of the body, and then releasing that and then tensing another one and releasing that and putting together different components, different parts of the body together and releasing that. Progressively helping those muscles to gradually become more and more relaxed and by doing so, we're also helping the individual to notice the difference between tension and relaxation and that I can do something that can contribute to how my body moves from this rigid, stressed state to a greater flexibility state and I'm better regulated. It doesn't mean I'm less frustrated per se, but that I'm managing it better, I'm regulating it better. And again, that's the key of what we're trying to help the child to do. Doing so again, dedicated time to practice. You wouldn't just say in the moment, take 10 deep breaths. You'd want to have practiced that. We might even say, smell the pizza, blow out the candles to get the sense of coming in, breathing in through the nose and blowing out. Um, for younger kids or if it's older kids, if it's maybe in a smaller setting, we could have a calm area, safe haven. And it's not a play area. It's not a, an area that we're going to as reinforcement, but it's a place that I can go and I can kind of I can decompress a little bit and then someone's going to come over and help me to process what happened. We might have some visuals prompting, thinking about the feelings, the emotions. We might have uh, some stuffed animals or even a pillow they can squeeze, they could hit. That's going to be safe for them. Uh, this is not a, a, a crisis area per se. This is really more of a calm area, although it could be if a child's struggling a lot that we're prompting them to go there um, more than they would go on their own. But again, this is a skill to practice. What that means is carve out specific time throughout the day where you're presenting those triggered situations where that we've written down, we're pulling one out and we're gonna practice going to the safe haven, the calm area on their own, practicing going by asking or telling an adult and practice where the adult prompts them to go because they're gonna have those different experiences. We want them to be more willing, more flexible to go when and where needed not first time, only time is in the real life situation. That's where we tend to see increased anxiety and increased resistance to that particular strategy because the child has not experienced it well enough and then they resist. It's like, if you like a sports analogy, it's bottom of the ninth, two outs, bases loaded, two strikes on you and either you're gonna get the winning hit or you're gonna strike out 
there's a lot of pressure there. And while you can't necessarily practice that situation every time, you can put the person in the, in the position of having lots of pitches and, and present the scenario in their head, which is what we want to do here is to get them to be more inclined, more experienced to practice that situation. I've mentioned video modeling. There's a, a lot of research that exists, not just the meta-analysis reference here, but there's been a lot more recent re literature regarding the benefits of video modeling. Model Me Kids is, is one that's uh, pretty common and, and, and used that has a lot of uh, benefits, a lot of variety of supports as well that's connected with, uh, with that if we're going to be doing video modeling. Um, I mentioned some of these things, so feelings identification, a check-in throughout the day, notice that our feelings might be changing and helping children with some of these core skills, the second half of that, of the slide here, learning to wait, accepting no, accepting help or asking for help, seeking attention appropriately, and asking for misses, missing or needed items. They're skills that as adults are really critical. We're waiting in a line in a supermarket or in a bank or a post office. We're accepting when somebody tells me, well, there's no, we don't have that anymore in the restaurant or we don't have that part here. So, and on and on, these are lifelong skills that we've got to carve out time to teach. Many behavioral issues, hence many behavioral plans, probably should have replacement behaviors that include those specific skills and carving out time, like a broken record here, of dedicating time to teach, practice, giving feedback. So modeling, the 3D model, we're gonna discuss it, break it down, demonstrate it, modeling it, and having the child practice or rehearse that. If we're not doing that, we're not gonna teach a child to learn to wait effectively, accept no, ask for help, and on and on. And therefore, you're probably gonna see the perpetuation of those behavior issues. And uh, you know, giving them the language, giving them language that I can be flexible, I can feel mad and I can stay calm and safe like we, we referenced before. So critical for their overall development. Um, helping them even to make a feelings thermometer as this, this child has. Putting up on some visuals, what I can do. I'm a big fan of visuals, hopefully you can tell that, whether that's for a child that's highly verbal or not, that we wanna be able to address kind of in a, a function, a total fun, uh, communication way, a total way of having not just language, but visuals, even for a child that's fully verbal, to be able to increase the likelihood that they're gonna have that total communication around them. And, you know, kind of getting it in a multi-sensory way as well. So infusing the social emotional language throughout their day, not just in the moment, People are more likely to really um, have that skill ingrained and utilize it when it's been infused after and in combination with direct instruction. So we can label emotions, teach kids that the feelings can range from one to 10, one to five, teach them that their feelings change throughout the day. We can have check-ins. We can give them different ways of, you know, being able to problem solve with that. And that's through validating. Boy, it looks like you're having a hard time. Looks like you're feeling frustrated. Let's talk about that. And giving them some options. What can I do when I'm experiencing this or that? How can I process that? Um, we also ask them, what's your ready position? So I like asking that, not just with the child's ready position, but the adults. So what is my ready position? How am I going to experience this? What am I going to do to help the child, help the children to improve their ability to, uh, to process this, to handle this, and how do I prepare them for the situation even more effectively? One of the, and I won't go through all the, the items on here, but when we think about when there are conflicts, what are the rules we have? What have we set up? So what are the confrontation time rules? Because things don't always go smoothly, and I often recommend that we sit down, we're taking turns, we're listening to each other. So whether it's parent and child or teacher and child, what's that interaction look like and having a plan specifically for how we're gonna promote and foster that communication. In any social situation, whether on the playground, in a history class in high school or in the preschool classroom, we wanna be able to cue, that is prompt or prepare the child for the, for the situation, coach them through the situation, that is giving them the labeled feedback, the behavior specific, feedback and guidance to help them to correct and improve the behavior, reinforce the behavior, and then review at the end. So we're gonna cue them, we're gonna coach them, and then we're gonna review and let them know and see how they did. 
Social problem solving. So we referred to that a bit earlier when we talked about decision making. Uh, really, the, the key here is that we're rather than focusing on teaching a specific behavioral skill only, we're teaching this kind of larger ability to problem solve and to engage in a model that's going to give the child kind of this proverbial toolbox that I can take this wherever I'm going and I know how to handle the situation, not necessarily because I practiced it, but because I know how to problem solve. And if you think about yourselves, you probably faced some kind of situation that was a quote unquote problem over the last several days, whether big or small, whether it was, well, what tie am I gonna wear? Am I wearing glasses or contacts? Do I wear my hair up or down? Uh, how do we get the kids into you know two different places when we only have one driver? Uh, what am I gonna teach the kids in my class today? How do I can, so, and on and on. And continuously we're problem solving, not because we were taught that skill through a certification or some other kind of course, but because I look at it and say, hmm, what do I need to do? I need to have some composure, stay calm, solve that problem, reach some particular goal, and then I'm gonna see how that worked out. And oftentimes I'm gonna access help. So even though we wanna be striving towards greater independence, you know, as this says, give a person a fish they eat for a day, teach them the fish they eat for a lifetime. Even though we're striving for that independence, we still access help, whether it's an accountant or it's an auto mechanic or an insurance agent, an attorney. We're going to get some help so that I can really know how to solve this better through accessing the adult or it could be a child. But we notice that we go through the steps. And we really have a plan that's going to help us as we were uh, referring to before. Um, talked about situations in a hat. Uh, literally, I, I will have, you know, kids have a family, uh, have, a, have a teacher, whomever it is, have them have a hat or have them have a container. And it could be that mother, father, sister, brother, whomever is in the family, they each have their own hat or container, or each child could or each person could have a different hat, um, either their own or, or all in one container. In a classroom, we could put it all in one container or hat, or each child has a different hat or container of their situations that we're bringing to the particular classroom or in the family that we're gonna pull one out, we're gonna practice that. So even if the child who's struggling more socially isn't the one that, that's practicing on that particular day, they can benefit from watching others involved in that situation, involved in that role play. We can even check in with them and say, hey, what did you notice that, that Jimmy was doing or, or that she was doing in that situation? We can also set up some problem solving situations. So we could, maybe the kids come in and there's a, a chair that's missing. Maybe we're on our way back from a special and the door is locked. Um, maybe the, the computer has been unplugged or the iPad hasn't been charged or they're missing a particular item to complete a vocational task or we've run out of copies of something. So whatever the situation may be that we're really helping the child to become more flexible by giving them some more situations. I've worked with a number of classes where we've done some uh, some kind of escapades where we're gonna go and we're gonna look for like a scavenger hunt. And the scavenger hunt re requires us to go with the kids throughout the building to maybe find a broom. So they have to ask a custodian, or maybe they need to find a an orange colored paper. Therefore, they'd have to ask one of the assistants in the office and on and on. So it has them thinking about, well, what's the problem? Hey, I, I wanna be able to find this. and where do I need to go? Uh, who am I going to ask? What do I ask? And in order to ask, I need to, like we talked about before with social language and conversation, increase proximity, make eye contact, say who I am, ask for help. So this problem solving situations, for example, through a uh, scavenger hunt is a good way to, to pull together some of these particular skills to be more effective. Um, there are lots of different social problem solving curricula. There's no one way to do that, whether it's in business, whether it's in education, social situations. So I've just listed a, a handful of them and certainly it's it's not a complete list. Um, I'm just gonna briefly reflect on uh, the curriculum that my colleague Steve Gordon and I have, uh, have co-developed called Power Solving. And we talked a bit more about that uh, in our previous webinar and it's something that we incorporate in our High Step program. And it's a curriculum where we're teaching kids specifically how to learn the steps of problem solving, of social problem solving. We're also increasing their ability to communicate feelings appropriately, to regulate emotions, anger management, friendship making, 
asking for and, and receiving help, becoming more flexible. And we do that through that 3D model. So we're discussing and breaking it down into steps. We're demonstrating through lots of visuals and having the children engage in role play. So there is a children's version and an adolescent version. There are workbooks that the students work in with lots of visuals. And there are teachers or facilitator guides, as well as parent carryover handouts. So you can just tear it off and say, here's what we did without having to prepare anything. And generalization activities to carry over to continue what we were working on in the particular group. So again, while there's no one way to engage in social problem solving, you want to have a plan of what are the specific steps, monitor that progress. So we're creating this toolbox to help kids. Uh, with Power Solving, just a couple other points that we use it in consultation and in a variety of different school-based settings for kindergarten through high school. And we have customers in 30 some states and, and about eight different countries right now. The key though is we're teaching kids to put a problem into words. Oftentimes you ask kids, what's the problem? And they kind of shrug their shoulders. I don't know, but we want them to be able to say, I was going to get a drink and then he jumped in front of me, or I was going to answer the question and then you called on somebody different. So whatever the approach is, what's the plan is we involves having the child to communicate what the problem is, to put some words with that or some other way of communicating that identifying and observing their feelings. Again, we're getting back to self-regulation, noticing, observing feelings, communicating feelings and measuring the degree or intensity of those feelings. Talking about what, what their goal is, how strong that goal is. What I really want to be able to do is to play that game. What I really want to do is to do well on that test where I really want to be able to go watch my favorite TV show. Okay, so how can we get there and be able to manage our emotions, stay calm, follow what my teacher or parent wants to do, and what are the host of different solutions? Let's check them out. Let's evaluate those. Let's explore and choose the best one and then put it in place and let's review. Did it work? If it did, why did it work? If it didn't work, what am I gonna do instead? So we go through these specific steps and what we're doing is we're fostering the social problem solving so that they can then apply that to a variety of situations. Okay, so we, we're teaching social skills, we're teaching social emotional learning, we're incorporating social problem solving, we're making sure that we're promoting self-regulation and an emphasis on feelings and working on conversation and friendship building. So when do we do that? Well, one of the biggest challenges, and we're a little bit limited with our, with our, our webinar today, but we know that research tells us that it's somewhere about 11 to 13 points. I had been saying 11 for a while, but I've seen some more updated numbers of 13, that it's somewhere about 11 to 13 point increase academically when students are receiving social emotional learning programming. So what that means is that we actually see improvement with academic functioning as a result of or correlated with social emotional learning. So when we hear someone say, we don't have that time in the day because we have to work on this and that and we have to dedicate time to teaching. So we get that. However, we actually do see improvement academically when we're incorporating that. So making time for that through direct instruction is key. It could be through a morning meeting. It could be that it's the health and phys ed teacher who's incorporating that. It could be part of a history or social studies lesson where we see many schools will carve out a particular period a day or once a week or a couple of times a week for direct instruction. And that could be direct instruction with small group, role play, that rehearsal time, and then kind of reviewing of the day as well. What did we do today? How did it go? This also pairs really well with what is the culture and climate of the school? So if we're gonna improve school culture and improve climate and increase social emotional learning, we've gotta look at what does the environment look like? What is it literally like when I'm entering the building or approaching the building? Who's greeting me? Is it just the security guard? Is it someone sitting at a desk? What happens when I get into that, that main office? Are staff looking down or are they looking up? Are they smiling at me? What do the walls look like? Is there color or are there colors on the wall? Are we recognizing student behavior? Can we get down to the child's eye level and does it feel inviting and engaging? Or is it kind of like that, that I'm in this prison and you know the walls, they don't do anything to incorporate and engage me? So we've got to step back and think about what that looks like. Greeting students literally when they're coming off the bus and then into the building, perhaps by an administrator or someone else. And additionally, being able to to communicate and to connect with them 
in the hallways. So not having our staff sitting at desks in the classroom, but being right there in the hallway and seeing what's going on in the hallway and greeting kids as they're coming into the classroom, whether they're preschoolers, kindergartner, elementary, middle school, or high school, to be able to help students to become more cared for and connected, which goes a long way with improving that the culture and climate. Um, just jumping in for a moment back into kind of the, the feelings that if we can help kids to become feelings detectives, as adults, we want to be detectives of how our kids are doing, what you can do during that check-in. So just even a moment, you know, you, sometimes you can tell with the child's voice or just their facial expression or how they're dressed. How are you doing? You can kind of get that sense of it. So as adults, we want to help kids also to be better feeling detect feelings detectives and to pick up on what does that look like and and how is my engine running? Am I running too fast? Am I running too slow? What can I do? What can I do to improve this? What can I do to kind of increase my ability to to process this and, and to understand how I'm feeling and how others are feeling within this environment? Um, if you've never played the game headbands, it's it's often a favorite for speech and language pathologists because it promotes some social language of asking questions and even giving comments. But you know, you're putting a card on your head and and there's a picture of something and you don't know what it is. And you're going to find out by asking questions, kind of like a 20 questions. But you're working on eye contact. You're working on tone of voice and, and patience and self-control and self-regulation. It's often easier to be teaching skills and promoting skills if we can do it in a fun, caring, supportive manner as we go through that. So successful social problem solving and social emotional learning involves this combination of direct instruction, incorporating video modeling or video self modeling, watching oneself. Some social narratives or a social story is, is kind of the brand name where we can prep and prime a child for what are we going to do when we go on the playground? What are we going to do when we go into this high school gym class with all of this noise? What does that look like? And then we need to really monitor progress. We need to be able to capture how is the child progressing? How are they doing? Are they successful with that? Well, when do we do this? Do we start in October and end in March because that's when the particular staff member happens to be available? So we're going to do this once a week and then we're going to kind of shut it down in, in April or May because we're doing some statewide testing and now we can't do the group for four weeks or six weeks. I know that happens in a lot of situations, but unfortunately, the research is really not great when we're just doing weekly pull out social skills groups if we're not doing anything else. So we have to infuse and carry over strategies across situations. We have to communicate with other people, what are we doing and how are we doing it? We have to really train to fluency, so lots of repetition, prepare them for new situations, incorporate other children who could be positive social, emotional, behavioral models so that they can really benefit from that as well. And having that combination of not just direct instruction, but the carryover through training staff, uh, sharing this with parents, Here's what we worked on today. Here were the strategies that we used. Here's your child's progress. Um, here's what you can work on on the playground, in the community, in your home. So helping them to be able to take that skill and carry that over. So for example, in our summer program, we have a direct instruction every day at High Step where we're teaching the children how to demonstrate that skill we're modeling that, having them practice. Then we go on the playground, then we're in the cafeteria, then we're doing a learning, a group, a group learning activity. We're doing a creative arts. We're giving them some greater independence with supervision and structure. So we're really promoting all of that and giving the parents carryover of, this is what we worked on today and here's what you can do. And helping them to kind of guiding them instead of telling them each time, here's what you need to do. It helps to expand that. And, you know, we've got some good, research in the field that says that when you're giving that practice and homework, while kids don't like that, and, and in our power solving curriculum, we call it power up activities, but it's essentially brief practice or homework that we see twice as much improvement in social emotional learning when we do have people practice outside of that session. So it's not just the repetition, it's that we're getting it to that point of we're creating those greater and new neuro pathways like we talked about before. Again, we talked about attention, repetition, focus, that's going to create it so it becomes a lot more automatic for that child as we go along. For some of the younger kids, or of course we'll call it something different if they're older, play dates, and as this caption says, sweetie, I think you're misinterpreting the meaning of the term play date. 
right? So kids we know don't play the same way they did years before. We've got to schedule it. We've got to structure it. And it's difficult because many children who struggle with social emotional skills are not wanting to or are apprehensive to in the, initiate the social contact. So we as adults either have to form that or to share with parents if you're an educator, with whom does a child seem to have a better relationship and or get the child involved in some structured activities that would promote that. Um, some quick tips, keep it short. Ideally just two kids because when you have a third child, well, somebody's often kind of the odd child out because they're not included. Um, keep only toys that are okay to share because if your child's not okay sharing something, they're gonna be upset, they're gonna be frustrated. Uh, we wanna review some rules and skills that are involved like turn taking and, and serve food, obviously checking for allergies. I mean, whenever schools have meetings or people have get togethers, there's food there. So if you can find out what people like, do that and plan and have your child involved in, in the planning, have your child involved in the greeting, having your child involved in, in what that looks like and, and lots of behavior specific praise lots of catching the child doing the right thing and giving them the feedback. Um, here's some examples of some structured and less, less structured activities. Um, I'm mindful that we've got about five minutes left, although for anybody that can hang on a little bit beyond one, uh, I'll continue and, and respond to some of the questions. But you know, thinking about there's, a, there's ways that we just need to probably schedule kids more and more and have a plan for that. Uh, a little bit more about promoting generalization because we just got you know so much to share. Training staff that are on the playground, training related service providers like speech, OT, PT, counselors, CST members. Like, what is it that we're working on here in this group, here in this direct instruction, so that we can carry that over? Doing a school assembly, I've done many of those where very simply we're teaching stay with play with, talk with. If we're in the cafeteria, we're just gonna stay with and talk with. Beyond that, yeah, there's a lot more you could say, but we're folks at the very least on, we want you to stay together and do something together. And then we're gonna give you that feedback. We're gonna notice who's not playing with someone, who's not involved, but being able to train staff to help notice that among the kids so that we can foster that greater ability to engage one another. There's some examples of some games and activities and some video modeling support. So some really great websites that you might find that are helpful. You could have some theme months, incorporating themes for social emotional learning, incorporating in, in a variety of different activities or specials throughout the day, making room for the hidden curriculum. So incorporating idioms. So we know that many children struggle with the language and not recognizing that. So there's some good strategies there, particularly Brenda Smith Miles has done a lot of work in the area of idioms and uh, the hidden curriculum, that which we don't necessarily teach, but is critical for children. Reinforcement. What we know about behavioral change is that if we're going to increase and have behavior sustained, we need to be reinforcing that behavior and then gradually fading that. So the next couple of slides, again, for anybody that didn't catch us in the beginning, we're gonna make the entire, entire webinar available for replay and you'll be able to catch these, these slides in more detail. But we're going to you know, be able to carve out time specifically to reinforce. We're going to catch kids being good. We do this in our summer program. We give a call. It's a caught being good phone call. We're going to let you know that we noticed that your child did a great job with this or that. So whether it's a positive note home or an email or a phone call, we're going to give some public displays of positive attention, giving feedback. In our summer program, we have a caught being good wall for our staff and caught being good walls for our students. And people, not just children, adults, we like to receive that positive feedback. So we're gonna recognize that. The couple examples you see here in fish and, and sports, that would certainly be more elementary version, but we could have a different version for adults. We, of course, we'd have a different version for middle school and high school students, and that's gonna vary. Um, we put these components together with our summer program, High Step, helping improve social skills through evidence-based practices, uh, which founded in, in 2000 by Steve Gordon and myself. So we're, we're happy to be celebrating 20 years. Just wanted to give you a couple uh, components of information about that, and then uh, I'll respond to some of the questions that have shown up. We have three locations. We have a location in Pennington. 
We have a location in Scotch Plains and a location in Marlton, uh, which is near Cherry Hill. And we run our program for five weeks. It's an extended school year program where we have many children that attend through their IEPs as part of extended school year programming and a number of children who attend through private private pay. It takes place from July 1st through August 2nd, and all of our staff receive a comprehensive training, and they all have experience in the field. And it's a really comprehensive 23 days of, as we affectionately say, bathing children in social skills through direct instruction and fun. And it takes place in an air-conditioned elementary school, and we have children from approximately six years of age all the way up through some children who are 21. But typically the population is about six through 17 or 18, but with some children that were, or adolescents, I should say, that we know uh, they may be a little bit above that age range. And we're focusing on all the skills we're describing here and incorporating video modeling, monitoring progress in that short period of time, trying to really promote uh, generalization and skill development through a variety of different activities structured and also giving children the ability to work with less structure so that they can improve their their ability to to navigate through the, that environment so we've had uh, well more than 900 children through the years in our in our um, 20 years soon to be 20 years of, of programming and it's the curriculum we incorporate is the power solving curriculum throughout our program. So they're having everyday direct instruction. We also bring in special events. We use lots of visuals, lots of modeling, lots of rehearsal to really promote that, that um, you know, effective feedback. So uh, lo and behold, it's, it's flashing up as one o'clock on my screen, actually 101. So uh, we still have actually 80 some people that have held on. So we really appreciate that. I'm gonna still talk for a little bit more and you know, kind of respond to, to some of the questions. If some of the questions were not answered that you had, uh, or if you have additional questions, you can feel free to email me. And I, I'm actually gonna, uh, I'll scroll this back to, to the beginning of the, the slide in just a moment here, so you can see my contact information. But you can certainly go through Behavior Therapy Associates, um, our website, and you can get some more information regarding uh, our practice and, and regarding um, our summer treatment program. So some of the questions that, that we were seeing coming in is asking, how do I make time in a busy schedule in the school environment when I know that I've got to address the academic programming and maybe my administrator isn't providing us that particular period? And that's a common challenge that there isn't any more latitude, maybe the remainder of the school year, obviously with a few more weeks, or that it's not gonna be in the budget to get a curriculum or to dedicate that time. So in those situations, what I would really encourage you to, to move back to is, how can I incorporate and embed at least some of this time? So the situations in a hat strategy that I talked about earlier uh, would be an example of that, that how can I incorporate that? Oops, I wanted to bring up the, the initial slide, it didn't come up, but, um, our website again is behaviortherapyassociates.com and you can contact me through through the website but we can or at high step h i s t e p at comcast.net h i s t e p at comcast.net if you email me there or through our website um, i can provide you with responses to any more individualized questions but if we incorporate situations in a hat if we set up 5 minutes of just some behavioral rehearsal before lunchtime before playground time, before a high risk situation, if we have that morning meeting. So while we may not be afforded a 30 minute block of time or a 30 minute period in which we can particularly uh, you know, schedule for that, that becomes increasingly more important just to carve out some of that time. Um, it's also, you know, one of the, the challenges that we also see is how do you help a child who doesn't really want to in improve their social skills. And we see that for some children, that some children are very interested in improving their own social skill situation. And others, it's really more the adults. It's the parent, it's the staff member who wants to improve. And what I would say is that it's, there's really never an age where we should be dismissing that and giving up on focusing on social skills. What we probably need to do is to put a bit more emphasis into helping the child to make some connection or recognition between my, my current situation and where do I wanna to get to. For an older child, it may be that they wanna be in the workplace or they wanna be more independent and living on their own. 
For another child, it may be, a, hey, I want to watch YouTube. I want to play my favorite video game. So in order to do so, I need to be a bit more compliant. I need to need to follow what my parents' direction is. I need to communicate what I want calmly in order to do so. So connecting what's more immediate and meaningful to them than perhaps in a, in a different situation where they're they're motivated where they want to really foster that friendship, but they're not doing so um, in that situation. So helping them to be able to make a connection that becomes a, a bit more meaningful. Um, another question that that we often get and you know I've, I've seen come up is, well, how do I uh, how do I encourage and, and get the support to be able to get others on board? That maybe I'm doing a a social skills group in the situation and um, how do I get people to um, to be get the others on board in the building? Uh, how do I um, be able to show them that what I'm doing is meaningful and making a difference? And what we really encourage people to do is to collect data. And often we say that word data and that becomes, oh my gosh, it's like taboo because that means more work. And the way I would encourage you to think about it is monitoring progress. So if you're an educator more from a parent's perspective, we would not be okay with a third grader, seventh grader, or 11th grader going to school and having no tests, no quizzes, no scored assignments. And a parent walks in at parent-teacher conference and you say, how's my child doing? Oh, just fine, uh, Ms. Smith. Well, well, how do you know? Um, I don't know. Just seems like she's doing a pretty good job getting her multiplication down. We wouldn't be okay with that. We would be monitoring it. So if we want to be able to uh, demonstrate that what we're doing is making a meaningful difference and is successful, we need to have some pre-test data or some pre-programming data and monitoring how the child is doing and then some post data. So in our summer program, for example, we have questionnaires that are completed by staff, I'm sorry, by staff uh, throughout the program and at the end. And we have parents that are completing a pre-measure and a post-measure. We've also had um, staff that have, or, or grad students that have done dissertations. We've had other programs that have collected data and shared that with us. So when you look at social problem solving or any social skill lesson you're working on, you have to have some means to be able to observe and measure how they're progressing, like you would with any other uh, particular situation. Um, some people I see are also asking, you know, to be able to get a copy of the slides. So uh, we'll we'll make sure that we send out a copy of the of the handout as well. So not just through you can replay the webinar, which uh, my marketing assistant Brian Maya will uh, assist us to have that set up, and it will ultimately be um, you know on our website. But we'll you'll get that sent out to you, I believe, automatically either today or tomorrow. The replay of today, and I'll also send out with your certificate uh, a copy of the of the PowerPoint from today, so you'll have that information as well. Um, maybe I'll just address one more point. I, I think I've gotten into many of the questions that have shown up, but um, one of the other challenges that we talk about is, how do I get my child to work on this skill when they're angry? And what I would say is that we probably don't wanna be teaching a new skill when a child is frustrated. And hopefully that's just sort of like, so social skills 101, but you would do much better to be able to work on connecting with the child and validating that when the child is engaged in tantrum behavior, it's safety and working towards some degree of calmness. And you've got to move along at the pace the child is ready. If the child is underneath the table and I come in, they say, Dr. Selps, can you get her or him out of, from underneath the table? My goal and intention is not to get them out from underneath the table. My goal is to connect with them and say, Boy, you know, first, is it okay for me to sit here? Is it safe? I'm not trying to get you out. Boy, it looks like you must be having some difficulty. Looks like you're frustrated. How can I assist you? Or what do you want? What, what got you in here? But I'm not really trying to get the child to be saying too much initially. And I'm not trying to be working on anger management per se. I'm just trying to connect and validate because in that child's life, in that situation, in that moment, they're thinking, Everybody's just trying to get me out and get me to do what they want to do, but I want to be along the same path so we can move together. And for successful social emotional learning, it's not just changing the child, but as an adult, you need to have some recognition of what is my role in the situation and am I moving it along at a pace that's going to be consistent with where the child is? Because otherwise, then it's like two bulls that are just really kind of banging heads together. We're not effectively kind of moving in, in unison. So social emotional learning requires some good planning, 
having some very specific goals, communicating that to all they're involved, not just the children, but besides the children, the other staff and parents, and having some means to monitor progress as we go through the process. Um, hopefully you found today that the, the tips, the strategies and techniques that I shared are helpful. If many of those are ones that you look at and you say, but that, that's not too challenging, wonderful, because it does not have to be rocket science, but it does require a plan and sustained intervention, because these are skills that are throughout the lifespan that we're forging ahead and helping individuals to really develop. Um, I want to thank you so much for participating in the webinar. You can look for coming to your email a certificate as well as a copy of the PowerPoint. The replay of the webinar will also be sent to you. And please, if you have any additional questions or comments, we would appreciate your feedback. And uh, likewise, if you have any questions regarding our practice or high step or power solving curriculum, we'd be happy to respond to that as well. I hope that everybody has a wonderful afternoon and thank you again for participating. Take care. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.